Hi, I'm Tommy Emmanuel. Welcome to Acoustic Magazine's 100th issue. Can you believe it? Wow. Uh, so, first question. Yes, let's let's hit the, the, <laughs> the, the technique stuff first. Mm -hmm. All right. Because you told me a story once that um, you used to listen to Chet. Of course. And yeah. you didn't realise he was using a thumb pick. No, I started out uh, with a straight pick. Like with a, with a, uh, Americans call it a straight pick. Mm -hmm. We English-speaking people, uh, you and I, so I'm an Aussie, you're a, you're a Brit, we call them plectrums, right? Uh, that's what I think. So, but anyway, I always, I tend to say straight pick because I get asked this question a lot overseas, you know. Um, but yeah, so I heard Chet playing Windy and Wong, and I was trying to work it out, and everybody else around me were so fascinated by him as well, you know. So, so I worked out how to go like that right? and mute it with my palm and you get that sound then so it and I could make it sound fairly close to what I was listening to off the record right and then when I, I started learning other tunes you know So I started to get a few tunes under my belt and get this technique going, but it was difficult and, and a little bit awkward, with, especially with a anything that was a little like, like right? Um, so what it was, was that I was supposed to be doing it with my fingers and I didn't have any left because I was playing, I was holding the, the, the straight pick with my index finger and thumb and I, the index finger and the second finger are your main melody mm. fingers in thumb and finger style. And so it wasn't until I saw a photo of, of Chet playing and he had a thumb pick on. And, and I had one of those moments where it was like, oh, that's it, you know? And as soon as I put the thumb pick on, it was like, like a, a, a wild horse was let out of the gate, you know? And I went crazy with it because all of a sudden, my right hand technique just came alive, you know, and, and I, I was already, um, my thumb just went straight into boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tick, without the aid of my finger, like that, and, and uh, my, freed my, my fingers up, and it was, it was a great day, I'll never forget it, you know, and uh, yeah, it was like being let out of jail or something, you know, because <laughs> everything was a lot, uh, came a lot better, and had better feeling as well. Sure. Can you can you just sort of take us through basic thumb pick yeah. routines? Or... Basically, yeah. To get to get started playing thumb and finger style, one of the things that you have to understand right from the start is that the fingers can't be involved much at all in the backing. You've got to train your thumb to be like almost like your accompanist, almost. You know. So and and. So I teach people this way. Um, I get them to put their fingers down here and leave them there. Don't let them do anything. Mm -hmm. And get your thumb to do... Right. So I'm playing... I'm doing a little bit of strumming with the, with the, with the thumb pick. Well, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of the chord through, but I'm basically going... marking out the bass part, right? Mm -hmm. Then... F... G, C. Now the rule of thumb is, if you're pardon the pun, um, uh, the first note of every bar should be the root note of the chord you're in. So if you're in C, your first note should be a C. When you change to F, your first note should be an F and so forth. You know, like uh, what I mean is, is if you're doing this and then you switch to F, you don't go. You go, and if it's B flat, then E flat, F, B flat, A, D, E, A, right? So, um, so you start out, hand, uh, fingers down, and just slightly muting with the, your palm here, and you get... C, F, G, C. 
That's the basis of, of, of getting the thumb independent from the fingers. Now, um, step two, leave your pinky down as your kind of anchor, all right? Some people don't do it because they, they find it uncomfortable. But most of the great players who have come before us, Chet Atkins, Merle Travis, Jerry Reed, they all anchor down. And I found it, it came natural to me to do that. So, little finger down as, as my anchor point. And now what I do is, this is exercise number two, is I get the thumb going and then I, I strike the, the chord with these three fingers. So you get... That's basically starting to spell the chord out with your fingers, keeping the thumb going. Now, uh, step three w would be to play an accent with your, with your fingers, uh, which is against what the thumb is doing. And you know, your hand's going to strike a, a roadblock here, and, and, and you, you're going to have to really work through it. It's like this. So the, the, um, the fingers are going ba 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 like that. So the thumb's going... It looks like kindergarten, but it's really difficult when you've never done it before. Step three would be to play, um, sorry, step four would be to play arpeggios with your fingers. So spelling out the chord like, like this. And then muting the bass. See that, how that works? So the, the, the underlying thing is that the thumb, the thumb is this steady rhythm, steady groove underneath. Then, as soon as you can, learn a tune like Freight Train and put it together. So you, you work out each bar. Here's the melody. Right, so you work out how to go that, how to do that part, and then keep the thumb going. So you practice that up until it starts to sound like music and then you can do stuff like do a key change so you play the first time around you can see So something like that, you know, starting with a simple song like Freight Train is a good idea and um, you just work in your ideas, but, but uh, get that thumb nice and steady. Talking of, of thumb picks, do you, uh, do you just use regular thumb picks? Or yeah, you... these, are, these are Jim Dunlop thumb picks and um, uh, I don't actually modify them. P people think I spend all day, you know, fiddling around with my equipment and I don't. I, I buy, you know, a bag of th thumb picks that has 50 pump thumb picks in it, and then I go through and find three or four that really do the business for me, and the rest I give away, mm. you know. Um, so uh, I can use a thumb pick that has a short end here or a long end, or I can modify the way I play to suit the thumb pick. Right. So I don't like 
de depend on, on my life, on my thumbpick being perfect. You know what I mean? I try to fit in with what, what I've got in my pocket, yeah. basically. Yeah. And I find as long as it's it's not like some of these um, slick picks and and some of the real plastic ones, I. I can't play with those because they. If if I start to really lay the groove in, they the thump it could fly across the room, you know. So I need a more heavy duty sort of thump pick, you know. And I also need a thump pick that I can grab and and do do flat picking with, you know. Mm. So, which is another thing I had to train myself to do uh, a long time ago when I was working with my brother Phil. Um, some of the tunes we'd play, like Sugarfoot Rag and tunes like that, I, I'd have to play. But, uh, I'd be playing that part, and he'd be going. He'd be playing single line melody, and then he'd say, then he'd give me a solo, right? And he'd go. Yeah. So I'd have to go. I'd have to do you know, sing, single line stuff myself. So I worked out how to play uh, like with a straight pick, with a thumb pick, you know. And not many fingerstyle players do that. But, um, you know, it, it's a handy technique to have. Mm. That's for sure. I've seen you um, play in concert quite a, quite a few times. Mm. And some songs you use the thumb pick, some songs you don't. Exactly. So if you were playing purely fingerstyle, do you alter your technique to accommodate that? It's it, it's all governed by the song, right? Right. So, um, songs like uh, uh, the man with the green thumb, where I play, you, you, you can't get that kind of groove without the thumb pick, right? But then when I play a tune like, um, let's see. Um, uh, trying to get an old timey kind of sound mm. and I'm also trying to be more subtle with my backing and let the melody just speak so I, I don't need the thumb pick I'm bringing the melody out with my with my fingers then playing the backing with with the flesh to give it that nice old timey what I call an old timey kind of sound right so so and then in the bridge of that that's a song of mine called old photographs and when it goes to the bridge, um, uh, there's a nice part in it where I need the melody to really sustain. So I go... Uh, uh, so the bass needs to be subtle to uh, get that from playing without a thumb pick. Right. And some of the other ballads I play, like Since We Met... Bum, bum, bum. In order to get that kind of uh, slightly uh, funky sort of feel to it, I don't need a pick on that either. You know, and then there are other tunes where uh, where I play with a with a straight pick. <laughs> it's still sort of hybrid finger picking almost because I'm using the straight pick, but I I'm, I'm using the straight pick because I want it to be. So it's still got that r rhythmic groove to it, and there, there's a, there's a strum within what I'm doing. You know, mm. it's it, it's it's hard to describe exactly because you have to have grown up playing the way I play and develop these kind of hybrid ways of of getting my music across. You know, right? Yeah. Do you, you use flesh rather than nails? Though? Yeah, my nails don't sound any good. Like you've got good nails there. Mm. My nails sound like paper. They, 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 they're awful, you know, it's not a good sound. So what, I, what I've done over the years is I've developed these calluses and so there's the sound of the callus, there's the pick, it's pretty close. See that? And there's nothing missing in, in, in the tone, you know what I mean? As, as much as like... Uh, I love the sound that uh, Chet got from his nails. I love the sound James Taylor gets from his nails and Stephen Bennett 
and people like that. Most people nowadays use acrylic nails mm -hmm. and, they, and you can get a big sound from those acrylic nails, you know. But I, you know, it just didn't work that way for me. I think I was about 18 and, and when I started growing my nails, I thought, I, you know, I was flirting with classical at that time. I got myself a Yamaha a nylon string and I was trying to, I was listening to Julian Bream records. And, <laughs> I'm trying to work out all this stuff by ear, you know, and of course my classical playing ended up sounding like a country guy playing classical, which is what I was, uh, what I am, you know. Um, but I, I grew my nails and they just sound awful. So I thought, no, nah, you know, I, I, I uh, developed these calluses. But, you know, this comes at a price. I've, it, when I take a break from the road, say if I, you know, had a week off, I still have to play hard at least once a day and really dig in to keep my calluses up because you take two showers a day and wash your car or wash the dishes or do something like I do at home, starting to, your calluses are getting soft already, you know. So I, when I practice, when I'm off the road, I, I have to practice like a demon, you know, I have to really dig in to keep everything, keep my, my sword sharpened, you know. <laughs> Just an, another point about um, muting technique. Can you just mm -hmm. go, because you said you, you lay the sort of fleshy part. Yeah, of this right here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, right. so it's right in front of the bridge. It's, it's, it's just basically to mute the bass, to take away the frequencies that are going to get in the way of trying to get the melody out. You know, so if you went... Not a bad sound, but when you go, the melody immediately sounds different, doesn't it? It pops out and it's got its own, it's almost got its own character aside from the backing. So it gives you that m bit more uh, separation, you know, and I, I like that sound. Um, the only, only other time that I that I use, you know, um, where I don't mute is, is uh, if I want to accent one part of a song. Say if I'm playing... then I would unmute. I wouldn't go, because it wouldn't work, right? So, uh, like in, in, in Doc's guitar, the famous Doc Watson tune, the first time round, I, I play it a bit more open. Like that. Then, then I, the next, second time round, I go, and, and I, I kind of mute it a little. And it, 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 uh, it's a nice change for our, our ear, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's subtle things. But I, uh, I also use muting to, uh, sometimes when I'm soloing, I'm improvising a solo, if I want to do like a long arpeggio thing, sometimes I'll start it, I'll start it with, with a mute, you know. There. Sometimes I'll mute it a little bit just to make it more subtle and that kind of stuff, you know. Right. Um, a bit about left left hand technique now. Um, one of the things um, I think somebody was asking me about your style once, and I, I said Tommy's secret is he's got five fingers, <laughs> and they sort of looked at me like, yeah. And I said no, he uses his thumb a lot. Yeah. Because you do, don't you? I do. I use my thumb a lot. You know, sort of playing different chords and, and that. And, um, you know, like uh, I was explaining to a bunch of students yesterday when we were going through, we were slowing down my version of Day Tripper and where it goes, Day Tripper, I wanted to get the Beatles harmonies there, right? So, but I wanted the bass to pump on the F sharp. So I had to train my hand to do that, which is an E triad with an F sharp bass. That hurts when you're first doing that, right? Because it's like a, the most unnatural, you know, but it really works. And I remember when I first started doing it, it hurt my thumb. Oh, but that's the sound I was going for. And you can't get it. Well, I guess you could do it. But for me, I was looking, I was looking for that. So, 
Yeah, that, that's utilizing my 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 thumb, and then the um, the dexterity of it, you know, and the fact that your thumb can move from side to side and up and down and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, I'm trying to be conscious of not overdoing it with with the thumb because there's a certain um, um, there's a certain look about a player who looks sloppy, you know, uses way too much thumb, you know. Mm. Um, and, and so, I mean, Richie Havens did everything with the thumb over yeah. the top. That was his style, right? Mm. So I try not to do, try, try not to make it look too, uh, you know, uh, strange with, with, with too much thumb. But at the same, and, and because when I watch Chet play, I, I'm, I'm humbled by the beauty of his left hand and how everything is so beautifully worked out. And so, and he's a nice mixture of every now and again he'll bring the thumb over, but but be, because he he trained classically as well, he's really got a beautiful way of of doing this, you know. And so I'm kind of trying to work towards that as well, and um, be be conscious of my fingering and the aesthetics of it. I guess you might say. Right. So you'd need a fairly narrow neck. Um, yeah, e exactly. Um, although I can get around fairly wide necks, I, I do prefer a narrow neck because uh, it, it allows me to uh, get to a lot of these positions. Like, for instance, this is a Merle Travis E7. Right? I call it a fistful of E, right? So, so, so E7. Right? So you've got the third. Then you got a seventh, then you got a third. And this is the shape that he used on the original version of Nine Pound Hammer. Mm. The, the song starts like this. That nine pound hammer, it's a little too heavy for my size, for my size. There it is, and it's got a certain sound. It's almost a, it's almost a honky tonk stride piano sound, isn't it? Mm, yeah. yeah, and I love that sound. So I use that as often as I can. <laughs> Excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the percussive thing, because obviously, so percussive acoustic guitar is very in. But you've been doing well, it for years. Well, I have, um, but in a different way. I, I I very rarely use a song where I play all the percussion parts mm. and all that, because it looks too much like a science experiment to me when I, when I see someone doing that and you know uh, playing all the parts and then trying to sing over it and all that it's like you know okay you got your motor skills together you got your uh, you got your uh, what, what do you call it uh, multitasking together but it's hard to watch because it looks like a, an experiment you know but it, uh, some people can really pull it off well a Andy McKee of course looks very relaxed when he's playing it and plays beautiful music uh, but there are a lot of people out there who put up videos and I watch them and I go, you know, it just, there's, there's too much, he's thinking too much about this. And if he misses one thing, it's all going to unravel, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a dancer, one foot wrong and it's all undone, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, as far as uh, doing percussion stuff on the guitar, I've always done that, but I've, I, I, um, I, I'm a drummer, so I approach it like, like a drummer, right? So um, even down to, um, in, in, in uh, Nine Pound Hammer, I break it down to like a drummer playing the brushes and a bass player, and then I sing over the top of that. So I do the bass with my left hand, and then I do the brushes here, right? That's why my guitar is so marked up here. In fact, that when I got this guitar, first thing I did is took a screwdriver on me <laughs> and scraped it all up the day I got it, right? Uh, because it had to be useful, because I need that sound to, to do that. So, you know, and I, I do that because it's fun 
And you never see anybody else do that, you know, and I'm always trying to look for something different to do for my audience and for my, my show and, and, and to surprise people because really we're in the entertainment business, girls and boys, and, mm -hmm. and we've we got to give people a good time. And if, if I, you know, bang up my guitar and bang my head on the microphone and play with a drummer's brush and do all, it's all in the name of entertainment, but it's musically, it, musically it all works. But it's all in the name of surprising people. That's really what it's about. It's like, let's see what we can do with, with this instrument that hasn't been done before, you know. So, um, but then, you know, I don't really do tapping and, and all that kind of stuff. And, I'm, and I don't play anything really much in, in altered tunings because I'm just no good. I'm, I'm having enough trouble with normal tuning. You know, people say to me, why don't you play a 12 string? I say, because well, I'm busy with six. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, but uh, there are a lot of people out there who are really good at the percussive thing. Um, uh, I'm, I just, what I try to do is uh, give people uh, an experience by doing doing drummers stuff, and and uh, I try to make it sound very ethnic sounding. I, I look for certain sounds on, on, on the guitar because, you know, these making guitars have a microphone that's really wide open. When, I, when I'm playing a concert, I've, I cover the hole with a feedback buster and I put the mic on 10. I mean, it's wide open, right? So it's, it's, I'm living dangerously, but it's <laughs> worth it because every, every, every sound that I make here all comes out like like a, a, a drummer and a percussionist have got together and you know uh, so you've got those and then you got you got those sounds you got the you got you got you got hear the difference there then you got and you've got yeah you got all different sounds you know and so you put all, all that together and and i make different patterns and stuff like that and there's a song i play uh, called The Trails, which is really a story of the struggle of the native people of America and Canada. And I try to, um, first of all, I listen to a lot of their music. And then I try to incorporate grooves and sounds uh, that, that, that sound authentic, you know. So I, I get that boom, 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 boom thing going, right. And then I add other sounds to it with, 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 with like delays and stuff like that. And it sounds like animals in the distance and stuff like that. And I can get the sound of a, of a horse when I, when I go real soft and I go close to the microphone, I can get the sound of a horse's hoof and then that kind of stuff. So there are all sorts of things that I'm, I'm looking for, you know, and there's a, like that, there's like a howl, there's a howl, a wolf howl mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, I go for all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Well, finally, um, can you just quickly run through your stage rig? Yeah. Um, well, this is my main main guitar. I have two of these on the road. This is a, a Maiden EBG 808, um, and uh, it has a the uh, pickup and microphone inside. And I go into a tuner, which is just a little Boss tuner, one of those ones that that looks like a square pedal. Mm -hmm. And I like those because they're really simple. Uh, and they're very reliable. Um, and that's that's a number one priority when you when you play as much as I do, you need equipment that's reliable. Um, so um, the 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 Boss tuner, it, the two things about it. First of all, when the light's red, you're out of tune. When it's green, you're in tune. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know that your B string is spinning at 652 decibels per minute. But you don't need to know any of that stuff. All you need to know is if you're in tune or not. You know. So. I got a tuner that's green light or red light. So that's what I need. And the secondly, it mutes. So I can be talking to the audience and, and look from the bottom of my eye, the bottom of my vision, I can see a red light or a green light and I don't have to lose contact with the audience and I can, I can still tune and they, they, they can't hear me tuning. If I feel I'm a bit out of tune, I can get it in tune. Um, so I come out of the tuner into what we call an AER pocket tools and this particular thing is called a colorizer. It's like a preamp, it's only this big. Um, and it's basically 
a signal, a, a, a big signal that my, my guitar is going into this little preamp and that's going directly out into the PA. So that's my first signal, is the, the colorizer. And my sound uh, engineer, Steve Law, tells me that the signal coming from the preamp is even bigger than the one coming from the amp. It's bigger and warmer. So when he puts that in the PA, that's actually the bulk of my sound, is that direct thing, right? And then, so I've got a bypass built into this, and I come out and go into the AER Compact 60 amplifier, and then I take the direct line out of that. So I have direct, uh, the colorizer and the amp, two signals. And he just brings them up and, and puts them where he wants, whether left or right or both in the middle or whatever. And so it's a combination of what the amp does. The amp gives me highs and mids and, and some grunt. And then the direct signal gives me that clarity and bigness, big, big uh, fat signal. And uh, that's it. I, I, and I carry three guitars, this one and the other one. And uh, I, there's a model, a, a dreadnought with a cutaway called a TE1. And I, I use bigger strings, I use medium strings on that one and I tune it down a whole tone. So my ear is a D. So it's a different sound, which is nice for your ear. Especially if you, you come to a guitar concert and you, you're, you've got two hours of full on guitar, you know, you, it's nice to give the audience some different textures, some different tones. So my other guitar I use for drop D stuff and drop G. And that's a, that's a different sound. And then the other one is everything down a tone. And I, I usually use that for stuff that has, where I play a lot of harmonics um, and where I can use a lot more mid range, you know? And so it's a big warm sound, but it has this nice mid range. Put that in the PA with some nice reverb and uh, it's delicious.